a ton of slides to get to. So I'm going to talk really quickly about the new storage engine that we're working on and some uh, ideas that we have are actually around the query language to improve the experience for Grafana users and for people who want to chain functions together. All right. Preliminary materials. Uh, so obviously we're a time series database. Everything is indexed by time and the series. We organize data in the database into what are called shards. Each shard is a contiguous block of time. In this example, we have one shard per day. And that makes it easy for us to evict old data very efficiently. So the line protocol for writing data into InfluxDB looks like this. You have a measurement. You have tags, which are key value pairs. And you have fields, where you have a field name and the value, where the value can be a float 64, an int 64, a Boolean, or a string. So unlike other like more pure time series databases, we actually support um, more value types than you'd normally get. And finally, you have a timestamp. I, this is like a second epic up here, but the truth is we have variable representation, so you can represent a timestamp down to the nanosecond scale. Uh, I just didn't put that here because it wouldn't fit on the slide. So each of these things is a series. The measurement, the tags, and then the field name maps to a series that we store on disk. We give each one a unique ID, and then the data is just the timestamp and the value, right? It's contiguous on disk so that a single series is quick to read and aggregate and query. So our requirements for why we're building a storage engine are, are these are the things we needed to get done. We needed high write throughput. And more specifically, we needed high write throughput when you have potentially hundreds of thousands of unique series. Um, as anybody who's tried to scale graphite out, you know, it can be painful if you have hundreds of thousands of series and you're writing individual files. So we needed really good read performance. We need better compression than what we achieved in 08 with level DB and much, much better than what's in the current release of 09. And some other important things were writes shouldn't block reads. We should be able to write to the data or write to the database at all time and reads should be able to come in and not block on the fact that a big write is coming in if you have a big batch of data. And conversely, reads shouldn't block writes. If a big write is happening, reads should always be successful. They should always be able to happen. And if we have a read that's super expensive and long to run, it shouldn't block writes from happening. So the other thing that we wanted is we wanted to be able to write multiple ranges of time simultaneously. For our use case, we're not just always appending new data. Sometimes you're writing in historical data, you're doing backfill, you're recomputing previous intervals. We wanted to be able to write into the data space at the same time. So if we're doing a historical backfill, we can efficiently do appends on new current data and have it not be a problem. Hot backups is something we're working on. We need to have many databases open in a single process. Each one of those shards is an underlying database. So this is a problem we had in the 08 line. We use level DB, and when we opened many databases in a single process, the entire thing would die because we had too many file handles open. So the new storage engine we're working on is called a time structure merge tree. It's like an LSM tree, but a little bit different. These are the components of it. It has a write-ahead log, it has an in-memory cache, and it has index files. This is very similar to LSM trees. Write-ahead log, LSM has. In-memory cache is like mem tables in LSM trees, like in LevelDB. And index files are very much like SS tables in LevelDB and LSM trees. So let's take a look at how the data goes through. So data's coming in. We write it to the wall. It's an append-only file, which is super, super efficient, as anybody who's worked with Kafka can tell you. Um, one thing is that when we do a write, we actually, by default, we always f-sync the data. So by the time you get a response back, you know it's durable on disk. That is an option that will make it so that you, you can turn it off and say f-sync periodically. But by default, it f-syncs. When you write the data in, we put it into an in-memory index so it's immediately searchable. Any query that comes in at this point will return that data and merge it with the on-disk index. So here's what the in-memory cache looks like. We have the cache itself, we have a flush cache, and we see, okay, everything's stored by 
this string, this series. And the reason why we have a flush cache is because flushes from the wall to the on-disk index can take time, right? They can take 20 seconds, but we still need to be able to do writes to new data, and we need to be able to query the data that's currently being flushed as that's happening. And then finally, we have this thing, this dirty sort variable, because obviously it's time series data, we have to return it in order. Uh, so people don't always write the data in order with InfluxDB, so this just tracks if they haven't, so that when a query comes in, we can sort it on the fly. That way, if you're writing data out of order, we don't sort it automatically every single time it's coming in. The values in memory look like this. Uh, there's a timestamp, which is uh, an in64. There's a value. Obviously, if it's a float64, it's 8 bytes. So you're talking about 16 bytes. We don't compress it in memory. We just keep it as you know, these raw structs. So then finally, we have the flushes that happen periodically to the on-disk index. There are a number of knobs and levers that you have to, to tune this based on the, the machine you have. Basically, you have a minimum memory threshold, which is the main thing. Uh, so we'll flush after that. And then you, we do give you the ability to set a max memory threshold, at which point the server will start rejecting writes and basically tell the clients to back off. Um, so. The index looks like this. Basically, it's a collection of files, these data files. The data files are all contiguous blocks of time, and they store many, many series within them. Right? So you could have this single file, and it could have the data for 100,000 series in that file. These files can overlap in their time. Uh, but for a specific series, they can't overlap. So we know that in a specific series, we have a contiguous block of time, then we jump to the next file, and we jump to the next file. And then for these data files, one will never overlap with a bunch of other ones. So this is kind of how we organize the data. Uh, so these data files are like LSM SS, uh, SS tables in the fact that they're read only. Once we've written them, they're immutable. So we just write them out, we memory map them, and then if we have to compact later on, we rewrite the file just like in LSM. And that's what we do. Periodically, we compact these files together. So we'll take these three data files, we'll merge them into one, which has the entire block of time. What that does for us is, over time, it'll give us better compression, because all the data will be together. And we'll get better performance in querying when we're querying long ranges of time, because all of it will be contiguous on disk. So we won't have to do a bunch of seeks, basically. Uh, so Compacting while pending new data, we have basically a write lock where you can lock a range of time so that if we have a historical range locked, we can still write uh, a new range. The other thing is that locking happens inside each shard. So if you have stuff that you're writing from six months ago, it's not going to matter with stuff you're writing a week ago versus stuff you're writing now. Okay, the data files. I have to speed up here. <laughs> this is what the layout of the data file is. It looks like an SS table. You have an identifier at the beginning, you have compressed data blocks, you have an index block, and a little bit of summary information at the end. Min time, max time, and the number of unique series that are in this file. The compressed data blocks look like this. You have an ID for the series, you have a length, and then you have the actual block itself. Blocks by default have up to a thousand points in them. They don't, obviously, as as the data is young, you don't have 1,000 points in a compressed block, you have fewer. But as we add more points to the compressed block, you'll actually see a better level of compression over time. That is something you'll be able to set in a config file so that you can test with your data to see what the best performance is in terms of both compaction, like uh, on-disk size, and query performance. Uh, the index block looks like this. It's basically a so sorted list of IDs where you have the ID and the starting position. Notice the, four, the starting position is four bytes. That means data files at most will be four gigabytes. And we just chose that arbitrarily, really, because we figured if we had to rewrite a file, we wouldn't want to rewrite more than four gigabytes worth of data. Okay. Memory mapping I mentioned. Compressed data blocks. 
the detail, well, well, the only one detail that's important here, if any of you read the paper, the Gorilla paper, they actually interleave the times and the values. We have them as two separate blocks, which means we can do some encoding tricks that they can't do, right? So timestamp encoding specifically, we can do something much more efficient, encoding based on precision and deltas. In the best case, we can use a technique called run length encoding, which means all the deltas are the same, so all we have to store is the min timestamp the delta, and the number of points we have. The good case, but not as good, is we use a technique called simple 8B. I'll share these slides so you can actually look these up later. <laughs> uh, and then the worst case is we store the raw values. For instance, if you're writing nanosecond precision timestamps, but you're only sampling once every 10 seconds, you're doing it wrong. Uh, <laughs> you don't need nanosecond scale if your sampling interval is 10 seconds. Um, okay, so uh, for float 64s, we use the exact same technique that was in the Gorilla paper. We use a library uh, written by Damian Grisky. Booleans are bits, obviously. In 64, actually, uh, um, something got merged in last night. So what we do now is double delta, then zigzag, which is the same uh, compression that Protobufs uses. Or if we can use run length encoding, we'll use that. So. That's really useful if you have something that's like a state, right? Like one or two or zero, and it doesn't change for the entire length of time. We'll compress it into just the value and the count. Uh, all right, for strings, right now we use Snappy. We're thinking about adding dictionary compression, which is useful for some cases. All right, I am way over. How's it perform? Compression depends, right through put depends, but. <laughs> We did a test with 100,000 series. We wrote 100,000 points per series for 10, what is that? I have no idea. 10 billion. 10 billion, I don't know if that number's right. We, okay. Uh, 5,000 points per on a C38XL, writes from four of the clients. We averaged around 390K per second. Using random floats, we got three bytes per point, which is not as good as you would see in actual production data because production data is never random. Uh, during the course of this test, we saw the IOPS was pretty consistent at about 400, which is much, much better than we have right now. Uh, and the CPU is 30 to 50%. The one thing is the compactions and the flushes would peg one of the cores while it was doing that, and things would get held up by that. So there's room for improvement here. We're not actually utilizing all the resources that we possibly could be. And this 390K per second, that's, we're not doing queries at the same time. Like that's. You know, there are lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. So test for yourself. <laughs> we have a detailed write-up that we document the storage engines that we tried before, why we did this, how it works, all this other stuff. All right, I have like two seconds to talk about Korea language stuff. <laughs> so what we found in our Korea language is there are three different kinds of functions. There are aggregates, like mean. There are transformations, like derivative or fill. And then there are selectors which you want to get at a specific data point, like min, max, first, last. Bills, like I said, that's a transformation. Our problem is in the query language, how do we differentiate between these different types of queries, right? SQL isn't really ideal for this. And finally, how do we chain functions together? Again, SQL really sucks for this because then you have to have like subqueries in this complete dirty mess. I wouldn't want to do it. So, uh, Torkel actually had uh, something that he was, I'm not sure if it was like an influx issue or a Grafon issue, but he, he suggested an alternative syntax and we kind of like riffed on it and came up with this idea. Which, uh, I suggested this, which I think is, I like it because jQuery kind of made it popular and I think it's kind of readable, which is like this function chaining syntax. Or like if you look at examples of people working with D3, it looks like this. So you can chain functions together, like the first one's an aggregate and then you can perform some transformations on it. Uh, one idea I had was we could move the from, right? The where clause is very common. You want the same where clauses across all the stuff. So let's just make it so we move the from into the select clause and you can select from multiple series at the same time. So you have consistent filtering applied to both. Here's an idea I had for joins. Basically, you join, joins a function, you say you join from errors, count value, this, this example was actually in a previous slide in a, earlier tonight. Um, 
I don't know, this was just an idea. I'm curious what people think about these ideas. So, all right. <laughs> I have 15 seconds for a question. <laughs> So the question was, uh, the storage engine sounds similar to RocksDB or Toku storage engine. Did we give thought to using one of those? Yes. When we first started, Influx Rocks didn't exist. Um, so Rocks is a fork of level DB, which is an LSM tree. A few things. One, the compression they use is snappy. We actually get much better compression on this data than snappy would give you because we're, we're making it specific to, to the use case, to time series. Uh, and the other is, we organize the data into shards so that it's easier later on to move them around a cluster. We don't, have, we don't really support clustering yet, but we know that's a, that's a design goal. And the design pattern for doing time series data in rocks is you organize it into column families, and then you drop those column families. But there's no way to move a column family from one rocks database to another, or all this other stuff. So there were a number of reasons that uh, made sense to make our own. So. All right, I think I'm out of time. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.